Welcome, everyone. It is my great pleasure um, to moderate this session. I'm Alex Cooley from uh, Barnard College and the Harriman Institute. And on behalf of my uh, Harriman Core Project co-director, Jack Snyder, uh, we'd like to welcome you to the latest session of what is part of the 2010-2011 Core Project, which extends through the end of 2011, on human rights strategies in the post-communist sphere. And the purpose of the core project has been to uh, bring together academic expertise uh, that have been thinking about issues uh, related to uh, human rights promotion or human rights, as is the case today, uh, uh, opposition, uh, into dialogue with uh, policy practitioners. Uh, and we have um, three really good ones here today representing uh, organizations that are at the cutting edge of these uh, events. So uh, we've had sessions on um, a variety of issues, uh, including uh, the justice cascade, including on human rights treaty ratifications, uh, new works on transitional justice, and today the theme will be the authoritarian uh, backlash against human rights uh, in Eurasia. So our panel is uh, composed of four people. Um, our academic today starting off will be Graham Robertson. He is an associate professor of political science at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, he is a, a specialist in Russian politics and uh, really does a lot of uh, very interesting crossover work on contentious politics, the politics of hybrid and authoritarian regimes. He's published in all the leading political science journals out there. His new book, The Politics of Protest and Hybrid Regimes, Managing Dissent in Post-Communist Russia, was published by Cambridge University Press in January 2011. Um, and amongst other things, I noticed during the Arab Spring, uh, Graham's name really made it across uh, the blogosphere, sort of talking about strategies and incentives that authoritarians faced uh, in dealing with these protests and movements. And he really broke it down, I think, in a very sort of helpful analytical way. So I think he's just the ideal uh, academic presenter on this topic. So welcome, Graham. Uh, then we'll have uh, Chris Walker. Chris is a director of studies at Freedom House. He oversees the team of analysts and researchers in devising overall strategy for Freedom House's analytical projects, and these include works I'm sure you're familiar with, um, including uh, Nations in Transits, Countries at the Crossroads, Freedom on the Net, and so forth. Uh, he is also responsible for generating special studies and reports. He conducts briefings for government officials and at think tanks and research organizations and he responds to critical news issues through statements and op-eds. He has a wide range of publications, a place like the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and Foreign Policy, um, and uh, also has a master's degree from Columbia University, so we're always happy to claim our own. Uh, Graham also has a PhD from Columbia, so this really is a Columbia uh, panel so far. Yeah. Then Hugh Williamson is director of uh, Europe and Central Asia Division at Human Rights Watch, and has been there since May 2011. He oversees the organization's work on human rights in Western and Eastern Europe, the Balkans, Turkey, Central Asia, and South Caucasus, Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus, so you can imagine he's a busy guy. He works with colleagues on a wide range of issues, including migration, discrimination in Europe, torture, severe rights abuses under authoritarian rule in Central Asia, and the impunity and rule of law in Russia. Prior to joining Human Rights Watch, uh, Hugh was a journalist with the Financial Times newspapers for 11 years, working as a correspondent in Manila and Berlin, as well as a Europe news editor during the 2008-2009 uh, financial crisis. Uh, and again, he has written and commented on a wide-ranging topics for international news outlets. Uh, finally, last but never least, uh, Robert Templer uh, is director of the Asia program at the International Crisis Group, covering 18 countries across the region. Uh, crisis Group, as uh, you all well know, has done considerable work on a number of human rights related and governance topics, um, including topics like Islamism, governance issues, post-conflict development, constitutional development, security sector reforms. Um, it's an organization that publishes uh, very timely and very hard-hitting uh, reports out there. Um, so. Um, 
With no further delay, let me turn the floor over to Graham for about 20 minutes, and I'll ask uh, the discussants to weigh in for about 12 to 15 minutes each. And in the end, we will take your uh, comments and questions. Let me just note, today's session is being videotaped and recorded, so if you ask a question, A, please identify yourself and your organization, and B, realize you will be part of the record uh, of these proceedings. Thank you. All right, uh, thank Alex for that very uh, kind introduction. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, it's also an honor to be among so, uh, on a panel with, with so many interesting people. Um, and being the academic in that list gives me a license to be completely irrelevant um, and boring. So, so that's also a nice position to be in, uh, in a way. I wanted to t use my time today to talk about uh, varieties of, con of contemporary authoritarianism in, in Eurasia. Uh, and I hope to convince you that this is not just a, a scholastic academic exercise, but, but one that really does have some uh, real world consequences uh, for, for some of the things that other people uh, on, the, on, the, on the platform tonight are, are interested in. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, different kinds of authoritarianism for, for two real reasons. One is because I think um, that the authoritarians we see in, uh, in Eurasia today uh, adopt very different kinds of, of techniques uh, to, to, to maintain their rule. And so we, 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 we witness very different kinds of uh, human rights violations and, and different kinds of, uh, of, of repression. Um, and so I want to sketch some of that. Um, the second reason why I want to talk about different kinds of authoritarians and authoritarianisms is that I think that um, it's likely that these different kinds of authoritarians are going to respond differently to efforts to liberalize or to, or to open them up. Uh, and any potential path towards uh, more liberal regimes are, are going to be different in these, in these different places. And, and so I, I want to talk a little bit about some research uh, that I've been doing on, 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 on this and in, in that direction as well. Um, if you read the Nations in Transit uh, 2011 uh, uh, report uh, on um, the, the post-communist space and you focus on, 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 on Eurasia, it's really wonderful. You learn lots and lots of really wonderful and interesting uh, things. Um, one of the things that, that, that's really striking, though, in that, um, in that publication is that the eight of the non-Baltic, eight of the, of the 12 non-Baltic former Soviet states are, are, are described in there as being consolidated authoritarian regimes. Um, Armenia is, 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 is one that's not, it's, 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 called, it's referred to as being semi-consolidated authoritarian, <laughs> while uh, Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia uh, are seen as transitional governments or, or hybrid regimes. Um, and I think, I think you know, there's a level in which that's absolutely correct. Um, uh, but there's also uh, variation within those, within those eight uh, that, I, that I want to explore a little bit today um, that I think can help us to understand better the nature of those regimes and the, and the, and the sort of the way forward, um, uh, if, if, if there is to be a way forward uh, within those regimes. Um, so I'm going to basically sort of try to reconceptualize or think about the countries in Eurasia as being consisting of three different kinds of, of authoritarian regime. On the first hand, we have a very highly repressive, or, or what I like to call closed authoritarian regimes. These are places where there's just no sign of public political competition is, is acceptable. Uh, and civil society is really severely repressed. And those are places like, you know, those are is Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, and Uzbekistan. Um, then there are other regimes which I think of as being hybrids, um, where political competition is legal and it's permitted, but that competition is very heavily skewed by the strength of authoritarian institutions on the one hand and by the weakness of independent organizations on the other hand. Uh, I have in mind for those countries, Russia, Armenia, Georgia, uh, Azerbaijan, Belarus, and, and, and Tajikistan. Um, and then there's another set of countries which really I think are highly competitive uh, uh, if, if somewhat rough and ready and probably not quite democracies, but nonetheless very competitive places. Um, and those are Moldova, Kyrgyzstan, and, and Ukraine. Um, and I'm not gonna, I don't propose to say much about those three uh, tonight, but I'll, I'll talk about the other ones instead. Um, closed authoritarian regimes. Now, there are other people who are on this panel much better placed than I to address some of the specifics uh, of, these, of these countries, but I think in, in general terms, we can think of these regimes as having their, their repressive apparatus very firmly rooted in the, in the, in the, Soviet, in, in the Soviet past. 
Um, they uh, continue to attempt to control all media, to basically cut their societies almost entirely off from alternative sources of information. Uh, they go as far as to regulate uh, forms of alternative forms of artistic expression. Um, the arrest and torture uh, of opponents in these regimes is, is, is extremely, extremely common. Um, they feature regularly uh, choreographed, if, if often badly choreographed, uh, demonstrations of enthusiasm and loyalty uh, to, the, to the regime. There's been a transformation of party-based patronage networks into purely uh, personality or, or from family-based patronage networks. Um, but nonetheless, these networks have, have really undergone uh, relatively little change. And there's enormously strong incentives for anyone who wants to make a success, either in business or in politics, to bandwagon with the uh, incumbents. Um, in each of those countries, th that system seems, uh, it's been in place now for a long time, and they do seem, they do seem very uh, consolidated. Uh, one thing we do know about uh, authoritarian regimes like that um, is that if they do change, change is almost always unexpected um, uh, and comes somewhat out of the blue. Uh, for the moment, uh, the major threat to, to stability in those countries does seem to be um, more from nature rather than from anything else, from the, the fact that the top of the pyramid in those countries just can't live forever. Uh, and so that, that each, of the, each of the leaders is going to die at some point. Uh, and as we know, this is, this is very often a... Uh, a moment of real crisis for closed authoritarian regimes. Although the very smooth uh, transition uh, to Berdi Mohamedov in, in Turkmenistan uh, suggests that, um, that, that even death might not be strong enough to, to, to upset the equilibrium uh, in those places. Um, more interesting, I think, for me at least anyway, are the hybrid cases like Russia, Armenia, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Belarus, uh, and Tajikistan where for various reasons um, the, or the elements of authoritarian control dominate, but there really is real open political opposition that's able to organize, um, sometimes even able to run, uh, if not necessarily win uh, office. Um, and in these countries, the calculus that's been made about the costs and benefits of completely dominating the information and political space um, have, uh, are, are very different than, than, than in the closed authoritarian regimes. And there is limited but very significant space um, for opposition voices and opposi opposition activity. Uh, in these countries, the main techniques um, uh, for maintaining control are, are, are quite different, I think. Um, lots have been said in the academic literature and elsewhere about uh, the efforts of these authoritarians to control uh, electoral outcomes. Um, and over the years, um, the uh, in incumbents in, 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 in countries like Russia and Armenia and elsewhere have become very good at it. Um, the ballot stuffing, which you know, still goes on um, and is kind of the, the old-fashioned way to do this kind of thing, um, it has become harder to get away with as, as sort of electoral uh, forensic techniques like, like parallel vote tabulation has, have, have become more effective. Um, but the menu of what, what Andreas Shedler called the menu of manipulation that goes on in elections in these countries is much more sophisticated than mere ballot stuffing. It goes from uh, influencing the supply of candidates through uh, elaborate registration procedures and rules about registration, shaping the demand for candidates through control uh, of, the, of the media and dominating of, of, of television in particular, um, to um, new, new ways of influencing how people actually exercise their vote once they get to the ballot box um, through uh, clientelism, uh, very often based uh, within, within enterprises um, or taking advantage of the, of the large uh, number of people in these countries that are, that are on uh, various forms of social welfare. Uh, in addition, authoritarians in places like Georgia and Russia in, per in particular have become really skilled at manipulating electoral systems um, to ensure that they get the outcomes that they desire. It turns out that national list proportional representation with a high threshold combined with, with uh, the, the hair system for redistributing, redistributing seats has become a really good way of turning um, either bare majorities or, or, or pluralities into supermajorities. Uh, in terms of seats. It's, it's sort of curious that proportional representation that lots of people associate with more pluralistic outcomes in democracies um, are really, is a really effective tool in the hands of, of, of authoritarians. I think that's one of the things that, that's, that's uh, unexpected in recent years. Um, but for my money, a more interest, an even more interesting aspect of this is the way that authoritarians in these countries have, have un started to understand the interaction between elections and uh, challenges outside of the electoral arena.
and notably uh, challenges that come from the streets. Um, hybrid regimes are, I think, particularly vulnerable to, to street protests and street challenges um, for a couple of reasons. One is they, they like, like all authoritarians, they lack pr procedural legitimacy um, that, that democracies have. Um, and they have a relative lack of, of, of reliable political information that makes the authoritarian always a little bit uncertain as to, as to what kind of support uh, protesters or other challengers have. Um, on the other hand, they lack the sort of the, 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 the real repressive, powerful repressive apparatus uh, of closed authoritarians, and they allow independent organizations to, to exist by definition, and so they're kind of in a, in a, in a, in a tricky halfway, halfway house. Um, this is, this is particularly true in a, in a, in a, in a context in which um, we know that uh, lots of, uh, while, while elections have played a big role in, in, in undermining authoritarianism in the post-Cold War era, roughly about half of the, of the periods of significant political liberalization that have happened in authoritarian regimes since the end of the Cold War have, taken, have involved elections. The other half have not, and, and it's, it's really been from, from street protest. Um, if authoritarian leaders had forgotten about this, uh, the Arab Spring certainly, uh, certainly uh, reminds them. Um, plus, the Arab Spring, I think, adds a new dimension to, the, to sort of uh, the, the, the dark nightmares authoritarians might, might, might have, uh, which is that much of the authoritarian strategy in uh, Eurasia and elsewhere has been involved making sure that there were no potentially um, plausible alternative leaders out there, that, that, that any alternative uh, figure around whom an opposition could, could gather has, has been eliminated. What the Arab Spring tells us is that, that leadership is important, um, but these leaders don't necessarily need to be well-known public figures. Um, they need to be activists and they need to be well-organized, but they, but they don't need necessarily to have a big public following. And I think that's, a, that's something that's, 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 that's relatively new. Um, so techniques for controlling non-electoral challenges have been really, really important, and I think it's one of the areas in which um, countries like Russia and Armenia, uh, Azerbaijan and others have really um, uh, engaged in a lot of research and development uh, over, the, over the last uh, 10 years. Some of what they do comes directly out of the old Brezhnev Brezhnevian playbook, you know, kind of uh, preemptive arrests around symbolic dates, uh, very strong shows of force against, against demonstrators they don't like, uh, laws on, on, on extremism which are very widely uh, interpreted and interpretable. Um, and very flexibly applied. But some of it's new too, and, and, and I think um, uh, some of the key innovations involve things like what, what I call licensing civil society and, and, and creating er ersatz social movements. In terms of licensing civil society, the um, authoritarians in, 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 in the hybrid regimes in Eurasia have been very active in, in efforts in developing civil society. And in, creating opportunities for funding of NGOs, creating opportunities for access um, to participation in governance at the local level and, and even sometimes at the national level, but only for NGOs who are willing to play the, play the game um, or who are able to play the game. And NGOs who are not willing or able to play the game um, have a, uh, find themselves excluded from, from, from these opportunities, excluded from uh, the registration systems that have been, that have been set in place and, and are subject of very often to, to harassment. Um, aiding, I think, some of the, uh, the uh, authoritarians in this process are things like the, 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 the way that the um, EU Eastern Partnership is managed, where, where the um, national governments now have the opportunity to, to offer international contacts, control international contacts for, for NGOs, and I think that's a really serious uh, set of issues. In a, alongside licensing civil society, there's also been the development of ersatz, what I call ersatz social movements. Um, the, creation of um, very often uh, youth-based pro-regime organizations that actively go out and recruit and, and try and attract the, the cream of, uh, of, of young people. Nashi in Russia is obviously the best known, uh, but there are a number of others uh, come a lot in Uzbekistan and uh, uh, Ireli, uh, which is now defunct in, in, in Azerbaijan, and lots of others that spring up from, from time to time. Uh, my favorite is a, is a new one. Uh, that, that in Uzbekistan that supports Islam Karimov's pr new pro-Russia foreign policy, which has the, the very cute name of uh, Nashi Rasiya Uzbekistan. Um, I think that just about says it, says it all. Um, these, these, these techniques are really very effective. Um, they're also extremely confusing. Uh, it's hard to know from the outside, for example, that the, the young lawyers uh, 
Association of Young Lawyers in Armenia is a, is a, a pro-government front organization, um, while the Association of Young Lawyers in Georgia is actually an independent uh, a group that holds uh, Saakashvili's feet to the fire on a regular basis. Uh, in Russia, the public chamber is a, a regime-sponsored substitute uh, for, for real political participation, while the public chamber of Azerbaijan is an opposition-run alternative parliament. Uh, so you have to be very, very careful with language uh, and uh, uh, what lies behind the behind name uh, in, in, in Eurasia these days. Um, these techniques, though, I think are, are very effective, but they're far from foolproof. Um, and civil society de development and innovation amongst civil society activists and, and, and opposition groups um, is, is alive and well. Um, and alternative political, ideological, and cultural space, the, the alternative political, ideological, and cultural space continues to grow. Um, so the regimes, I think, over time are increasingly being pushed into more and more repressive um, uh, positions. Uh, this has been, I think, evident in, in, in Central Asia recently, um, where the example of the Arab events is probably most keenly felt. But I think we'll also see a lot of this in, in, in Russia uh, over the election cycle of, of 2011-2012. Um, Russia is currently the site of, of, of uh, many thousands of protests, events, uh, every single year. Um, it has, uh, most of them are, are pretty small. Um, but as we know, uh, uh, small protests can grow large, into large protests in the right circumstances. Uh, and Russia has at least some of those circumstances in, in, in place. Um, there's a very clear, uh, active, innovative cadre of, of activists and oppositionists in, in, in Russia who've cut their teeth in the pretty harsh world of, 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 of the Putin era. Uh, there's a very vigorous blogosphere, uh, a very highly networked set of activists, um, and young people who are very skeptical about the, the direction the country is taking it. Um, the real question is, I think, going forward in Russia is whether there is enough indignation out there and, and, and whether it's widely spread enough, and I, I think it's a little early to tell. But I think the upcoming election period is going to be interesting for what happens in the streets as much as what happens uh, at, the, at the ballot box. Um, I want to finish, I don't know how long I've, I've got left, but I want to finish by talking about um, some things to do with uh, how we might help and how, we might, how these different kinds of authoritarianism um, might, uh, might be exploited or might, might, might be used. There's lots of research um, been done on different techniques of exposing electoral fraud on international diffusion of protest techniques and tactics. Um, but there's not much... Uh, research on the different kinds of effects that international assistance programs have on different kinds of authoritarians. Um, and I think it's really important because I think there are good grounds to believe that different kinds of authoritarians are likely to have different kinds of responses and, and, and to evolve in different kinds of ways. So let me wind up by just suggesting a couple of things, uh, ways in, w in which this might happen. This comes out of a, of a, of, of a series of papers uh, that I've been working on with a colleague of mine at, at Princeton. Um, a guy called Grigory Popelikesh, um, in which we've been attempting to analyze patterns of all major episodes of either political liberalization, political opening, or political deliberalization, political closings that have taken place in the, in the post-Cold War era. And so what we did was we, we used uh, Freedom House and, 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 and Polity reports uh, to identify um, 92 cases of, of countries that underwent moments of significant political liberalization since 92, uh, and 64 cases of countries that went un underwent significant deliberalizations. Um, and some really interesting sort of patterns or stylized facts are starting to emerge from this. And I wanted to just kind of put two on the table um, for you to tonight, uh, which raise, I think, lots of unanswered, at least in my mind, uh, questions. Um, the first is that in thinking about political liberalization in very closed places, the ones I started with, the idea, the dream of overthrowing uh, the dictator or replacing authoritarian incumbents uh, with someone better uh, might not be the right way to think about how to go about engineering improvements. Um, looking at our 92 liberalizations, we find that in the most authoritarian places, political liberalization is more, more often occurs from the top down, um, in, in which uh, incumbents stay in place uh, and then do a very gradual incumbent controlled liberalization process. The classic sort of cases of this are places like Tanzania uh, and Ghana, and this is maybe a, a model for somewhere uh, like Kazakhstan. In more competitive places, um, liberalization is more likely to come with the ouster of, of, of incumbent rulers, and one in these 
thinks here of Serbia in 2000 and, and, and Ukraine in 2004. Um, moreover, getting rid of incumbents is not always going to get you where you, where you want to go. Um, in looking at our 64 cases of deliberalization, we find that in more competitive uh, regimes, deliberalization is often the result of the overthrow of incumbents um, in coups or, or, or such, uh, such events. I think you think of uh, Azerbaijan in, in, in 93 being, being, being a pretty good example. Um, the second thought that I want to leave you with comes from looking at the relationship between international aid uh, and these moments of, of political liberalization and deliberalization. And the message here is that the effect of, of, what you, of what you do depends to a significant degree on the context in which you, which you do it. So what we've been doing is looking at, uh, there's a, 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 source of, uh, a new source of data on international aid called Aid Data, um, which allows you to separate out um, aid projects really for the first time on a large scale by, by the purposes that these projects are actually uh, intended for. So what we did was we looked at the differential effects of um, what are called democracy and governance uh, assistance projects. Um, and we separated out projects that are really about governance, that is about helping governments and states do what they do better, um, and projects that are really about helping civil society and NGOs, in other words, about helping uh, non-governmental organizations. And what we found was really intriguing, and, and, and I just wanted to put it on the, on, on, on the table. First, what we find is that governance aid, maybe not surprisingly, tends to strengthen governments. Um, this means that uh, what you see is that governance aid makes deliberalizations, makes more increased repression less likely to happen, but it also makes liberalization less likely to happen. Um, and that's pretty much a, across the board. Governments, governance aid tends to help systems of rule stay in place. Um, the effect of aid to civil society and NGOs, by contrast, is, is a little more uh, nuanced and a little more uh, tricky, I think. The optimistic part of, of, this, of what we're sort of finding in this project is that in less repressive contexts, you know, the, 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 the Ukraine, Moldova, uh, Georgia type places, Western assistance really does, can be shown to have a statistically significant effect and a, and a, and a large effect on helping political liberalization. Um, and preventing uh, uh, authoritarian regression. So it really does seem to work in those contexts. On the other hand, in more repressive contexts, uh, aid from international organizations seems to contribute to, 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 to deliberalizations and, and not to liberalization at all. In other words, where civil society and opposition groups are already pretty weak, providing them with international support from international donors may uh, make incumbent authoritarians actually more paranoid uh, and more repressive and, 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 and sort of defeat the, the, the long-term goal of what we're trying to, trying to achieve. Um, those are, I should stress, uh, statistical results that need to be examined very carefully in, in, in specific cases in the light of specific experiences. But I do think they provide some interesting food for thought, at least some hypotheses to think about uh, in the context of international assistance and different kinds of authoritarians. So I, I want to sort of leave you with the overall message that different kinds of authoritarianism represent different kinds of challenges, um, both for domestic uh, opponents of the regime and for the international community. Thank you. So Alex, would you like me to... I'd like to first off thank um, Alex Cooley and Jack Snyder for the invitation uh, to speak here with you all this evening. Uh, I'd also um, largely agree with what uh, Graham suggested, including um, how we value Freedom House's Nations in Transit project. I'd note that the uh, staff who work on the project are here tonight. They really do a great job in getting a very uh, demanding project out the door each year. Um, and I think just off the bat to respond to a couple of things that Graham mentioned, I, would, I wouldn't disagree with his reframing and using a slightly different lens for the non-Baltic former Soviet states he alluded to. I think we um, have a, a breakdown that very much follows the findings as we have them each year. It's not to say that that's the um, only way in which people could interpret these countries. And I think a good deal of what uh, Graham suggested in his 
analysis uh, really makes quite a bit of sense, and in fact, it'll be part of what uh, I'll touch on here. But I thought for the purposes of this discussion, I would focus a little bit less on the backlash dimension of this question in the sense that clearly the uh, repression that is applied by the regimes in the non-Baltic former Soviet Union, and I think if we define Eurasia more expansively, we could quite easily include China in the discussion, uh, is such that it's, it's at very uh, sharp levels at the moment, and that's putting it modestly. If you look at um, the range of sectors and the range of institutions that are under pressure today, it's really quite dramatic. And I think we might quibble over the distinction between a little bit more and a little bit less rep repression in some of the states that uh, we're discussing tonight. But I think if you look at the systematic nature of repression across the institutions that are relevant to uh, basic human rights, basic institutional accountability, you'll find that in this part of the world, it's really quite um, uh, extensive. So we have 80% um, uh, of the non-Baltic former Soviet Union classified as authoritarian, consolidated authoritarian. It's about 225 million people. And in essence, what that signifies is that basic rights uh, and guarantees that should be afforded by the state are not provided to the citizens in these countries. What I, what I thought I would do is focus a little bit more on the strategic part of the title of this uh, event this evening in the sense that some of the tools and approaches and instruments that these regimes are using are evolving and are rather sophisticated in the sense that while um, authoritarian regimes of the stripe that Graham put into the consolidated category, Uzbekistan, uh, Turkmenistan and Kazakhstan clearly uh, use all of the tools at their disposal to repress alternative voices. I think as you move down the continuum of countries, you'll find that there's an extraordinary degree of repression, but it's actually more refined and more sophisticated in many ways. And I thought I would at least make an argument and suggest some of the ways in which this is both um, deeply uh, problematic for ordinary citizens who live in these countries, but in some ways more pernicious because it presents some challenges that you might not have found during the uh, Cold, War era, Cold War era when things were more uh, black and white in many ways. I think today you see a lot more um, modernized authoritarianism, which I think confuses the West, which is one of the points that I'd like to uh, get into the discussion tonight, uh, but also um, provides more of a cushion for ordinary citizens in these countries. So as Graham noted, the, the region we're talking about has a diverse range of authoritarian states. It, in, in my view, it ranges from some of the world's most repressive regimes, including Turkmenistan and um, uh, Uzbekistan, uh, all the way to regimes that are repressive, nevertheless have some openness and uh, at least hope for meaningful change, and we might include in there uh, Moldova, uh, Ukraine, although uh, Ukraine is a good case study today because some of the promise and some of the optimism that we all would have discussed tonight if we had the same conversation, say, four years ago, um, seems to be moving in the wrong direction and testing the proposition that uh, the roots had grown significantly deep on the governance side in Ukraine to withstand the sorts of pressures that a um, seemingly authoritarian-minded leadership over the last year has started to push. We have uh, geopolitically important cases that uh, I'll tend to focus on in this discussion because they're the most influential uh, on a variety of levels, economic, politically, diplomatically, in their interactions with uh, the European Union and the United States. Uh, these countries are also uh, deeply integrated into a variety of structures at a, normal, a number of levels, whether it's economic, political, at the security level, and they have influence that they're exerting in these forums and on, on these platforms. And as I noted uh, earlier, uh, they're more sophisticated and they're using uh, more nimble approaches. If we look at Russia, it's in the news recently uh, for a number of reasons, most um, prominently due to the return of uh, presumably Vladimir Putin to the Russian presidency. 
My, my colleague Tyler Roylance has a blog post on Freedom House's blog today that is uh, very insightful on uh, this notion that while the choreography that's bringing Putin back to the presidency was artful, it's adhered to the letter of the law in the sense that there's been no constitutional violation, uh, you could make a strong argument that this is not necessarily following uh, the spirit of the law, especially given the depths to which um, it seems the agreement between the two principles here uh, included a return to Putin some time ago. Uh, the fact of the matter is if you look at virtually all of the non-Baltic former states that fall into the consolidated authoritarian regime, as Freedom House defines it, they've all found ways to uh, make sure that dominant political figures or powers retain uh, the top position in the country. This ranges from Azerbaijan to Tajikistan to Kazakhstan. Uh, Kazakhstan, among other countries, has lifted term limits, given presidential immunity, uh, has drained the country's parliament of any opposition whatsoever. Um, Azerbaijan, which I didn't include in the influential list there, but I think it's um, at a tier maybe right below the countries I listed there. Important energy partner, security partner, uh, it's a Council of Europe member, it's um, more involved in international uh, fora, it's just been awarded the international, uh, the Internet Governance Forum uh, for the coming uh, session. It's really rather incredible if you think about it. Although I would note that Tunisia, not so long ago, also hosted the Internet Governance Forum. You can draw your own conclusions about what that suggests going forward. Um, in Russia, some of the tools that have been used to uh, safeguard the regime, and I would argue create a more sophisticated set of instruments and approach uh, in the current environment, we're in 2011 after all, um, it's really remarkable if you consider the degree to which information flows, commerce crosses borders, and yet you have systems that, uh, in my view, are very effective in limiting uh, p politically consequential discussion and managing it, and that's something I'll come back to in a minute. Even in the countries that are below the most um, autarkic, in the case of Turkmenistan or Uzbekistan, but even in, in slightly um, uh, more open regimes. I think this is one of the things that needs a little more um, uh, review uh, to see just how effective it's being in, in retaining uh, the sort of profile these regimes have. The term democracy, I think Graham mentioned correctly that it's very important to think about the usage of language and the conceptualization of terms, both at a micro level when you think about the way in which a, an NGO or, or an association is defined, but I think also at a much higher level of analysis, if you look at the way democracy is used today. In Russia, you have the formulation of sovereign democracy, which the argument as it goes is that, look, there are a lot of different democratic uh, systems that can be put in place. You can have a variety of different um, uh, ways of, of having democracy evolve. It's clearly true, but I think what you see is by any measure, uh, Russia's system where there's really very little institutional accountability, very little um, uh, of an ability to hold powerful figures to account, uh, in my view, very um, circumscribed discussion of politically consequential information. Uh, they're fighting to retain the use of the term democracy because they value it, at least rhetorically. Mass media management is a critical component of this and I'll touch very briefly on, on how the education systems are working in Russia, China, and elsewhere in the region, but I think this is something that is also understudied but a critical impo critically important dimension of uh, what we're confronting in the authoritarian um, context. So democracy is distorted when we have these discussions. I would say in Russia it's certainly the case. In Kazakhstan the regime routinely uses variations of the term to defend its interest. Azerbaijan, it's also the case. China, very much so. You'll hear um, democracy with Chinese characteristics. There's really a fight to um, uh, arrogate the term for the purposes of the authorities there. Uh, independent institutions are rejected as being Western. Uh, there's, a, there's a contestation going on to subvert these bodies. Uh, this would include the OSCE's Office of Democracy uh, democratic Institutions and Human Rights, which has been uh, the focal point of a very 
concerted campaign and rather effective campaign, I might mention, to limit its ability to monitor elections, to do meaningful uh, work on rule of law issues and democracy issues. Um, and if we look at some of the um, hybrid regimes or regimes that have had more promise neighboring Russia, including Ukraine, Georgia, uh, Kyrgyzstan, uh, the public discourse from the leadership in uh, Astana, Moscow, uh, Baku will routinely cite these as being chaotic and unstable developments, which perhaps they are to some degree in the immediate aftermath of the upheaval, but I think what you see is a systematic campaign to um, tarnish these sorts of developments in a way that would have own, the, the own consumption of these issues, the domestic audiences in Russia and Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan say that you know, this isn't really for us, this idea of opening up political space or having meaningful political competition. I think that's the, the dominant narrative that you see in the discussions as part of this larger effort to uh, distort the term democracy and its concept. I would stress that in these settings, they're not ignoring it. They're not saying this is um, something that shouldn't be in the discussion. They're actually engaging on this. If you look at um, state media in Russia, which today is uh, wholly or, or virtually um, dominated by the Russian authorities, and in Russia today, it's important to note that something on the order of 80% of ordinary citizens get their news and information from television, despite a very rapid growth of online use. It's still the case that for news and information of political consequence, most of the country gets its news from television in Russia. I believe that's also the case in the other uh, instances I cited. It may change with time, but for the moment, as a snapshot, it's, um, it's not the case. Of course, the countries that I've alluded to uh, principally here are uh, hydrocarbon reliant states. This also pre presents a different set of challenges. No surprise that um, they have certain advantages, at least in the short to medium term. Uh, what this means over the longer term is a different question in terms of how they uh, manage to uh, implement any sort of meaningful reforms that would allow, uh, for example, a serious discussion about diversifying the economy. I think it's very interesting to note that in all of these countries, Russia first and foremost, the top polit political leadership routinely cites the need to diversify the economy. So it's not as though this is something that is um, off the agenda, at least rhetorically, but in the meantime, after nearly a decade of this discussion, there's been no meaningful headway in any of these settings, and I think one could reasonably argue that part of the reason you see this inability to at least get minimal traction on a debate is that there aren't really meaningful policy actors that have the sort of traction, the sort of profile, the sort of oxygen you need in mass media to make the, the case for meaningful policy alternatives. Critical in the discussion, Graham alluded to this, I'll just cite a few other points that are relative to this. You don't have a Cold War profile of media management. You don't have the sort of overweening dominance of ideologically and otherwise of uh, mass media. What you see is a, a kind of um, selective uh, a la carte construction of the things that are effective in a modern information inf environment for suppressing things that matter. So you have, um, among other things, intimidation and attacks and often uh, outright um, blocking of international media. That includes the BBC, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. Um, irrespective of what one thinks of the uh, information that's being broadcast, what you found is in countries ranging from Russia to Kazakhstan to Azerbaijan and Armenia, which by many lights is uh, a bit more open, there are active efforts and rather effective efforts to uh, keep these uh, information sources off the airwaves in these countries. It's happening a little bit different, differently than it did uh, 25 years ago. Nevertheless, it's happening today. It's essentially happening by blocking um, the FM radio broadcasts of affiliates that had originally agreed to carry this content. It gets very little attention, but it's one in indicator and one signal of the degree to which these regimes are looking to um, 
suppress, block, limit information of political consequence. They're more than happy to have pop radio come in. They're more than happy to have entertainment programs come in, all free flowing. When it comes to issues of po politics, uh, strategic economics, the other sorts of issues that would be at least in my definition of politically consequential discussion, those are the things they focus on. China uh, is adapting its media model. I won't go into too much detail on this. Also doesn't get much attention, but China's using a market-based model to ensure that news organizations create information that is commercially appealing but politically anodyne. And editors and journalists that stray from this line face either professional penalties uh, or very severe personal penalties. And it's been incredibly effective. This is despite the fact that you now have all, almost 500 million uh, online users in China. Uh, when it comes to state media, uh, which today still pr produces uh, most of the news of, and information of political consequence in China, uh, it's been incredibly effective. Uh, using rule by law rather than rule of law, libel laws that's still on the menu and used um, not um, excessively, I would argue, but I think you have enough cases in most of the non-Baltic former Soviet Union so that it targets the people who are too vocal and, of course, sends a very important signal to others who would think about um, taking on powerful officials or taking on important issues or consequential issues. Uh, state media remains very influential in these settings. I think we sometimes become mesmerized by the uh, internet and the power of online media. I think it's very important to remember that most people in the non-Baltic former Soviet Union are still getting their news from state media. And then finally on this issue, uh, they're really looking to obstruct uh, as much as possible of what matters, but not everything. It's neither possible today in the current information environment, nor is it desirable from the view of these authoritarians. Coordination goods, think of all the things that um, the most effective authoritarian regimes, even the regimes that would escape um, the worst categorization as being um, intensely uh, consolidated authoritarian regimes, they very much focus on denying coordination and organization. So even if you do have a discussion of corruption, and you do have this in Russia, you do have it in Azerbaijan, uh, there's a discussion of corruption within limits. There's certain um, taboo issues that uh, don't get discussed, but if there's a pretty diverse uh, range of discussion on corruption. That doesn't uh, affect these regimes in the sense that they're not going to try to suppress all of it. They will keep a careful eye on things they think will cross the line and somehow allow organizations or activists to coordinate in a meaningful way. There's also an active effort online, which is, I wouldn't minimize its influence, but I think its, its influence, the trajectory of the influence is significant enough that these regimes are now starting to uh, get into the game in a much more meaningful way. You'll see this in the form of the 50 Cent Party in China, which are um, paid activists or uh, state officials or state surrogates who go online to either subvert or confuse otherwise uh, legitimate discussions on issues that um, the regime feels are meaningful or um, perhaps uh, threatening. Same thing is happening in Russia with groups like the brigades and, and other uh, perhaps less um, identified groups that are out there. And also picking spots, they manage their targets and, and try to focus in a way that is uh, most um, efficient in their view. Very briefly, if you look at the textbooks and the curriculum that is now um, uh, standard in Russia, China, uh, just as an example, it's really quite remarkable. I think you know, we're, we're actually just, just debating and discussing um, civil society and institutional issues in, in many ways in a, in a either snapshot form or short-term form. I think to the extent uh, the curricula and the schooling um, that's now in place in Russia actually grows roots and has traction, and it's hard to determine precisely how deep the roots are, but to the extent it does, if you stipulate it does, it suggests that the uh, degree of illiberalism and the degree of, of jaundiced perceptions of the world will be more acute than uh, we would otherwise imagine. I think this is very important because the dominant narrative in the 90s was, well, 
Even if things are a bit rocky in many of these regimes for the next years, just wait till the younger generation comes. They'll be more liberally minded. When they come into positions of power and influence, they'll be able to guide things in a different direction. Basically, have to wait for the current generation to make its way through the system. It's not so clear whether that will actually be the case. These regimes, it, I would say the most uh, sophisticated and modern regimes, and I would put Kazakhstan, Russia, Azerbaijan, I'd include China in this category, have been very effective at retaining and co-opting um, elites and young elites and young talent in a way that uh, suggests there may not be this bending towards liberalism as the younger generation comes in. And this is something, in my view, that is uh, terribly understudied. I don't think there's much out there at all on the implications of what this sort of um, nationwide instruction would suggest in many of these settings. As I alluded to, um, these uh, most influential regimes are not uh, simply uh, creating troubling human rights environments within their own borders. They're actually rather active beyond their borders in a number of different fora, uh, trying to circumscribe as much as they can the human rights and democracy dimension of these um, enterprises. These regimes, I think it's also important to note very briefly, are cooperating and they're sharing information, they're learning from each other. Uh, there are a variety of different ways, even beyond the Eurasian um, region where you see interaction and, um, and support. So finally, uh, as Graham notes, on the one hand you have some very resilient authoritarian regimes. Uh, they learn from each other, they've been uh, refining their techniques. I think I would second this idea that for all the um, real and I think in some cases presumed re robustness of these uh, regimes, they are by their nature unstable and they don't have the sort of institutional uh, cushions and roots that would give them uh, the ability to withstand catastrophic shocks. Uh, and this doesn't suggest that things will change um, in the immediate term, there's no way to predict this, but I think had we had this conversation a year ago, and precisely a year ago, there wouldn't be a person in the room who would have suggested that uh, regimes with similar political governance profiles, not to say they're identical in other ways, but there wouldn't be a person in the room who would suggest that we'd have the sort of uh, changes in the Arab Middle East that we've had in the last eight months. So, uh, in the to the extent you have uh, challenges that maybe we can't predict or imponderables, I wouldn't be surprised to see um, more dramatic changes in a number of the uh, countries in question uh, sooner rather than later. I think in the end, um, the questions that Graham raised, which I think are fascinating and critically important on understanding uh, how Western support can be both helpful rather than unhelpful, meaningful and effective, and that we do um, no harm, first and foremost, uh, will be especially critical given the scope of the challenges in these, in these countries. Thank you for your attention. Can I just carry on? Sure. Hi, good evening. Again, thanks for the invitation. Um, I find both of those talks extremely interesting and useful for my own work and for work at Human Rights Watch. Um, obviously, as sort of a representative of a human rights organization, um, the analysis we've heard so far sort of um, fits with, with the way we see the world, pretty much, um, but we work on it in a, in a slightly different way, and our focus is on tackling these governments on human rights abuses and documenting um, documenting those abuses and bringing those um, to the attention of the governments themselves and to international players who have influence in those countries. So um, my, my talk will look at it a little bit more through that, that lens, obviously. Um, I thought my idea this evening was to focus on two of the countries we've talked about, uh, where we, we, we work in on pretty much most of the countries we've talked about this evening. Um, um, but I thought I'd pick Kazakhstan and, and Azerbaijan as two countries to focus on where we've done a reasonable amount of work um, in the last few years um, and in a way look at the issues through human rights issues in those countries this year 
uh, or in the last couple of years, um, and, and, and try to look at the issue of um, this sort of strategic backlash against human rights in these particular countries. Um, as we've, I mean, I've picked those countries in a way because, I mean, from our point of view, from a Human Rights Watch point of view, one might look at the, the most repressive regimes. I mean, we do, we've done a hell of a lot of work in, in Uzbekistan, on Uzbekistan in the, over the last couple of decades. Turkmenistan is obviously uh, a terrible case in Central Asia. But, um, so we, I could talk about those cases, but I thought it would be useful to talk about these ones in a way because of um, what Chris was saying about the sort of, the, the, what did you call it, the modern, you know, the sort of modern nature of the, of the way these governments um, manipulate um, their, uh, uh, manipulate the ideas of democracy, of stability, and so on. And, and it's useful to, to look, at, look at these issues, look at these countries, because it, it, we learn something, I think, in terms of the way human rights organizations have to work and tackle such countries. Um, as we've heard, um, so, so my talk is going to focus on, in a sense, why, these, why look at these two countries, why they're important. The first part, then I'm going to look at um, four areas of immediate human rights concerns in each, countries, in each of these two countries. Um, and then uh, finally looking at sort of what, that, what the human rights challenge is in tackling these human rights abuses, both for the governments themselves and also for the West. Um, in, sense, in the sense of why they're important, um, these are, you know, as, we, as we've heard, these are important energy economies. They're, within the region, they're, they're relatively important economies in themselves, and they're important for security reasons. I um, mean, if, if we take Kazakhstan, the, um, I looked at the, the per capita GDP the other day for, for 2010, it's over 9,000 US dollars. That's a, that's a pretty big economy. That's bigger than, than, for instance, two members of the EU, Bulgaria and Romania. It's almost as big as Russia. So, it's, so compared to some of the Southeast Asian tiger economies, it's almost as big as well. So it's actually quite an important economic powerhouse. As we know, it, it, project, it projects itself as an economic powerhouse in Central Asia. Azerbaijan is a bit of a smaller economy, $6,000 per capita um, a year, but nevertheless an important economy in the region. Um, Secondly, they're, imp they're important and worth looking at them because, as we've heard, they've got close ties to the West. Um, in many Western companies are invested in both of these countries in terms of oil and gas. Um, uh, they have stable international relations with the West, and that's an important point to make. Unlike, um, say, Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, where the rela relations are obviously fraught, these countries have a veneer of of um, respectability in terms of their relations with the West, which makes them, um, which increases their legitimacy um, and, uh, and makes it more difficult to, to press such human rights issues. Um, and thirdly, the other reason why it's important to look at these is, is what we both the, um, our previous speakers have touched on, this sort of model of development which they both um, developed um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a sort of a form of stability, an alternative narrative of what democracy means in these countries, what, um, uh, what role the youth play, the role of the elites, and so on. So it's a sort of, um, they're not, the human rights abuses are not, um, uh, um, it's, a, it's a more subtle form of, um, of social, and eco social and political uh, repression which goes on in these countries, and it's not as, as straightforward or as overtly abusive, abusive as, say, in Uzbekistan and, uh, uh, and Turkmenistan. I was interested in your comment, Graham, about um, um, uh, Kazakhstan being in the first group, the most repressive group, and you mentioned torture. According to our, I mean, according to our reports, there's not, uh, there hasn't, there's not significant levels of torture in prisons in Kazakhstan. Um, and that's what I mean by that such a government um, is a signatory to, obviously, to many international human rights conventions and portrays itself as um, as being, um, a, 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 to some extent, a model member of the international community, OSCE chairmanship last year and so on, from Kazakhstan. Um, I was going to touch on four areas of, of human rights concern to bring, a, bring in a few examples from the last 12 months or so. We're in Human Rights Watch, we're in the process of preparing our annual report, which is published in January, so we're, in these few days, writing the drafts of chapters on these countries. So I've been sort of gathering some of the, the data and the information about human rights issues. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, well, the first issue is, is um, locking up your opponents. Um, in both countries, 
in the last 12 months, there's been a significant crackdown on political activists and human rights defenders. Um, as you may recall, those Azerbaijan watchers among you, back in March and April, there was quite a lot of, there was quite significant protests in Baku, sort of um, inspired by the Arab Spring, um, and quite heavy repression and rounding up of political activists in these cases. Um, in some cases, over 50 to 100 people thrown into prison in one evening, um, and given prison sentences between uh, several weeks and three years in some cases. Um, and those have carried on, that, that, that sort of repression. Similarly, um, in, April, in, in um, August, in, in uh, Azerbaijan, a, a leading um, human rights uh, defender and organizer in, in um, Baku, who has a, a, a human rights center in the center of the town, was the target of, um, relative, of selective destruction of her house. There's land, there's, and land clearing going on in the center of Baku, which in itself is a human rights, a major economic and social human rights concern, but her house was, was targeted and, and destroyed, um, and a clear example of the government um, targeting a significant and prominent human rights defender. In Kazakhstan, um, similarly, there have been, um, if one takes the example, probably the most significant um, human rights but one of the most significant human rights concerns in the last few months in Kazakhstan has been the, the protests in, west, in the west of the country since May among oil and gas workers and those associated with the oil and gas industry. Three or four major companies, workers, several thousand workers in each case have been on strike. Some of these companies are Chinese or Italian, partly owned. So they're international companies. Um, and in, in, in both, in, in each of these cases, um, there's been... Um, uh, arrests of protesters um, and in one case the union, le the union lawyer has been, um, was arrested and in August imprisoned for six years for her union organizing, acti her union uh, legal advice activities. Uh, um, a, a sentence we saw was, was um, completely disproportionate given that she was simply pursuing um, her normal union uh, legal advice activities. The second aspect I talk about is um, um, no chance to gather, so freedom of, freedom of assembly. Um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, in, in Baku, um, protesters have been, um, have been rounded up in Arab Spring type protests, and in Baku, not a single demonstration has been um, given permission to, to be organized. Obviously, the regime on paper allows demonstrators to, to gather but um, not a single one has been, was allowed so far this year, according to our, our researcher who regularly goes to Baku. Um, and secondly, in Kazakhstan, um, one, just for uh, the demonstration, a demonstration by one person, you need to make a, an application to the authorities 10 days in advance, and that's, often re and that's rarely given. So, um, and as I said, uh, the protests to do with the strikes in Western Kazakhstan have been um, Many people have been arrested simply for sit-ins outside the factory or in the local town squares. Um, the, uh, the other area I wanted to talk about um, in terms of human rights concerns was um, controlling the message. This is something we've, we've heard about a little bit so far this evening. Um, in terms of efforts to, to, to um, limit the, the access of ordinary people to international media, to the internet, um, to outside interpretations of world events and also international interpretations of events in their own country. As we've heard, um, uh, many websites are blocked um, and newspapers um, closed. In both countries, there have been editors and, news and journalists arrested and harassed this year. Um, in uh, our, the latest data we have for Azerbaijan, gathered by our, our, our researcher, there was a, at least 50 journalists have been harassed or beaten this year. Um, and several newspapers have been shut down. Three um, bloggers in Azerbaijan have been thrown into prison this year as well. Um, in Kazakhstan, um, again, several uh, newspaper owners have been imprisoned. Um, there's, um, for such a supposedly open country in terms of the way the government uh, deals with it, um, internet screening is quite prevalent. According to data from one Kazakhstan NGO, 125 websites are blocked. Uh, at this current time, another 170 are regularly checked and, um, and often added to that list. So there's a significant efforts to, to control the message, as I say. 
Um, the last area I wanted to talk about was, um, was the sort of challenges this poses um, in terms of doing human rights work in these, in these countries. Obviously, our, our, our basic approach is that both of these countries have signed international human rights covenants and therefore have an, an international obligation to, to fulfill those and to, and to uh, respect the rights of their citizens. Also, as we've heard, um, Azerbaijan is a member of the uh, Council of Europe, and that adds increased and um, other levels of responsibility on human rights issues, um, many of which it ignores and, and um, does not allow special rapporteurs into the country and so on. So those are areas of significant concern. But obviously in the post, the, that's the sort of basic level of, 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 of um, the responsibility of, the governments, of these governments to respect, um, to respect human rights issues. Um, obviously in the sort of post-Arab post Spring era, one obviously also looks at the issue of to what extent is the Western government's um, tendency to prioritize stability over reform really the best way forward. That's what um, European Union member states and Brussels has tended to do or did tend to do with um, North, African, North African countries and it took some time for them to shift, shift their agendas and shift their priorities as um, events in Tunisia and Egypt unfolded early this year. And as we've heard, um, you know, political change in these countries in Azerbaijan and countries like Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan comes in, un in unpredictable sorts of ways. And even if it may in the past have led to um, political change within the elites, there's no reason for the, for the regimes, regimes themselves or indeed Western political interlocutors to believe that will happen again. So in a way, stability is programmed in instability is programmed into the future of these, um, of these countries. And those are, those are messages which Western governments need to sort of pay more attention to as they balance up the, 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 the foundation of their relationship between economic issues, um, security issues, and energy-related issues. Um, the other side aspect of that is a sense the international legitimacy um, um, which these governments um, crave. We've heard some of, the, some of the comments earlier on this were sort of being involved in international organizations and, and gaining um, credibility from that. Both of these countries are important members of, of an international um, uh, government company NGO alliance, the EITI, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, for instance, um, which uh, both of them gain a lot of international credibility by being a members of that because Western governments were involved many international NGOs and many international companies. And while Human Rights Watch wouldn't criticize EITI itself because it's a, it's a valuable initiative to, to promote the transparency of flows of oil industry revenues in the government and efforts to show to some extent where those revenues go, nevertheless, it might be worth the governments and the NGOs and the companies looking harder at how that money is actually used in the, in the countries and whether it does lead to more economic equality rather than inequality. Um, and um, uh, I didn't know about the, um, the Internet government, government Forum, which Azerbaijan is hosting. I don't know if you've heard that they're also hosting the Eurovision Song Contest <laughs> next. Um, for any Europeans in the room, that's uh, interesting news that next May, the Eurovision Song Contest, this sort of slightly bizarre, slightly culturally terrible festival is happening in Baku. Um, and again, they're, they're doing that, they won the competition, but they're very proud of, of their victory of winning this and, and want to put on a good show. Um, uh, and hope Western entertainers, governments, media organizations will, will give them that as well. Um, we're taking it as an opportunity to, to launch a campaign to, to try to get the release of several political prisoners and to, and to campaign for better media freedoms in the country. Um, I've, for the last couple of days, I've been, um, just to wrap up, for the last couple of days, I've been at a, at a large meeting of the senior managers, senior managers and analysts from Human Rights Watch, and we were, we were looking at what we can learn from the Arab Spring. Human Rights Watch played a, was quite active in many countries in North Africa for the last few months, um, as you may have read and, and heard and seen. Um, and we were looking at what messages we can, um, what we can learn for that, for, for what one of my colleagues has been calling a, a Central Asian Spring. Um, and um, one is simply to, to re remain as, 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 as involved as one possibly can as a human rights organization in the region. Um, 
and uh, stick with the human rights defenders in the region and be ready for when, um, when the, the uh, unsettling events which we've heard are likely to come do indeed come around the corner. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, good evening, and um, thank you to Alex and to the Harriman Centre for organising this. Um, as I'm the last speaker, um, more or less everything has already been said by my <laughs> esteemed colleagues, so I'm left with uh, a slightly narrower agenda. I would say I'm going to talk uh, specifically about Central Asia. My uh, work doesn't extend beyond that, so I don't have the breadth of uh, expertise of my colleagues here. I'm going to pose sort of two provocative points um, about Central Asia. The first is, are there any parallels out there that might give us some sense of how things will play out in Central Asia? And I would argue yes, and this always annoys people from Central Asia immensely, but I think the parallel is West Africa. And it's West Africa from the 1960s up to the present day. I think Central Asia is several decades behind, but is following a very similar trajectory in many ways. The first uh, decade after independence was uh, in West Africa and I think in Central Asia was a time for what you might call a sort of celebratory nationalism, which was a, a time for new airlines and new currencies and big new football stadiums and uh, new capitals and, and in some cases the development of a, of a new ideology, but an ideology that was actually developed by people who had essentially been educated in the metropolis. I mean, these were people who had been educated in Paris and London and had come back to their countries, often after long periods away, and then come up with sort of new modernizing um, agendas for their countries. And this, in some ways, looks a lot like Central Asia in the 1990s, a fairly ebullient time, fairly optimistic time. But it soon sort of turns into uh, that nationalism that they're trying to build is relatively unsuccessful and it's not actually sort of grounded in very much in the cultures uh, of these regions. Tensions bubble up, the nationalism becomes uh, a slightly more aggressive, intolerant form. And this is what you've seen really, I think, in the past decade in all across uh, Central Asia, a period of sort of consolidation of elite rule, uh, consolidation of all of the controls that we've heard about. Uh, a greater effort to um, control historical narratives, to control education, to control the media, and in many ways drive out, in most cases, dissenters or lock them up in some cases. But what you're coming to now is the period where you may see a sort of slow breakdown, a slow breakdown in a number of errors. One is that all of the people from the metropolis, uh, the Russians in the case of Central Asia, who had mostly kept the infrastructure running in these countries, are leaving or retiring. Uh, the last generation of Soviet educated specialists will sort of leave their jobs in the next five to 10 years. Uh, there'll be no more Soviet educated teachers, doctors, engineers, people who keep the heating going, any of these things. And that essentially means that there are no, none of these people, because none have been educated in these countries, in these five countries, since 1990. So you start to see a sort of collapse in infrastructure coming up. I think you're going to see a much more aggressive uh, forms of nationalism, much more intolerant forms, um, that the sort of the new, the, the new ideas of, say, countries like Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan um, were fairly sort of thin paper over much more complex ethnic situations that lie underneath that. And I think we're seeing this already in Kyrgyzstan where the, there's just been this sort of profound nationalistic shift in the past few years where even the more sort of liberal parts of society have adopted an entire sort of vocabulary of quite extreme nationalism and ethnic identification. And this is something that you also saw all across West Africa um, in that period. The, the sort of fourth decade after independence in West Africa has seen uh, extraordinary levels of conflict in Sierra Leone, Liberia, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Nigeria, pretty much all these countries. And what is clear is that uh, a degree of prosperity, such as in uh, Cote d'Ivoire or, say, in Kazakhstan, has not protected these countries from uh, 
you know, very serious uh, violence and, and conflict. Sometimes that conflict has spread from neighboring countries. Uh, certainly there's been a huge amount of sort of uh, funding and enabling of conflict by different countries there. But you can also imagine this happening in the current environment in Central Asia where you have uh, a whole group of leaders who, who don't get along, have very little contact with each other, who uh, often take very hostile acts against each other, mining borders, uh, occasionally invading each other, briefly, normally, um, but certainly operating in a fairly hostile way. And certainly all the borders of Central Asia have hardened very significantly in the past decade. You see very little open movement and traffic of goods and things around this region nowadays. So I would say, and I, you know, I'm opening this up as a provocation to you all to, to contest this, um, that we are heading into a period, I think, of, uh, of considerable conflict and difficulty in Central Asia. Now, there may be dampeners on that by virtue of China's presence next door, by virtue of Russia's presence next door. Those are certainly things that didn't exist in, uh, in West Africa. Um, but at the same time, I think there's going to be a reluctance to, to interfere. We saw this most recently with the ethnic violence in Osh. Uh, Russians were very unwilling to, to mobilize any sort of force to bring that under control. So I think there's going to be very considerable resistance. It's going to take very, very high levels of violence before any of the sort of major regional powers are likely to step in to sort of contain this. Now, the second sort of provocation I'd like to put out there is the past 10 years have essentially seen organizations like my own crisis group um, and others like Human Rights Watch more or less fail entirely in Central Asia. It's not that we haven't produced good reports. It's not that we haven't uh, had very dedicated and uh, effective staff in these places. It's that we've simply lost the battle for the narrative, that across Central Asia now there is simply almost no popular governmental civil society uh, media support for ideas of human rights or the protection of civil society or individual freedoms or any of these things. And we have, I think, really failed to develop that. There was a lot of talk in the midst of the Arab Spring about would this spread to Central Asia. And my view is no, because I don't believe that there are any of the sort of narratives out there in these societies at the moment. And a lot of this has been to do with the, I think, for example, the failure of democracy in Kyrgyzstan to actually deliver any improvements in people's lives. We've had governments that have squabbled over power, but they've very rarely delivered anything. In fact, in most cases, they've actually undermined the delivery of uh, public goods in, in any way. And I think one of the reasons for our failure is exactly that idea of public goods. We've sim The West and Western actors, including international actors, have failed to deliver any broad public goods to anyone in Central Asia. Um, there have been you know, pockets of aid and whatever. It's mostly been, I think, incredibly ineffectual. But there's been no sort of improvement in the rule of law. In fact, that's mostly, I think, declined. I mean, if you look at these countries during the Soviet period, I think they were probably less corrupt, more predictable than they are today in all cases, in some cases less repressive, because I think uh, in many cases, inst institutions that we think of as being very repressive, like the KGB, were actually moderating the behavior of local elites, whereas when they left, the behavior of local elites was completely sort of uncontrolled in, in many ways. So what you have is a situation where we've completely failed to deliver, I think, any of the broad public goods of uh, the rule of law, economic growth. Um, any sort of uh, basic equalities, broader issues of education, uh, none of these things have happened. And I think it is a, a, a moment to, to assess um, what benefits have come to Central Asia. And I would suggest very few. And to me, it echoes another comparison, which is how we've essentially behaved in North Africa over these, all these years. And the degree to which our behavior in North Africa has left us with very few policy options, very few interlocutors, very few friends, really, across North Africa nowadays. I mean, I know everyone is trying to switch, um, you know, very rapidly into claiming that they were supporters of Arab revolutions, but what is quite clear is that nobody was. Uh, you know, everyone was extremely anxious about all these processes. And I think we got ourselves into the same situation in Central Asia. 
of having a very narrow focus on, on purely on security issues, really purely on Afghanistan, in fact, and uh, ignoring the sort of broader engagement, the broader delivery of goods to, to those uh, things. And I think uh, you know, organizations like mine have in many ways not grasped that as early as we should have done, and that we should have had a much uh, sort of broader, perhaps less elite-focused uh, approach to these countries and what was needed in these countries. And, uh, but I do think um, 10, you know, it's now really 20 years since uh, independence in all these countries this August. Isn't it? Um, and it's time really, I think, for a, a reassessment uh, from all of us about how effective we've been in terms of our assistance, aid, engagement with uh, the whole of Central Asia. Great. Thanks to you all for those uh, very stimulating presentations. Uh, I usually open it up at this point, but I actually am going to take the chair's prerogative to throw one more thing on the table. And there's been a lot of debate over the last couple of weeks over U.S. security cooperation with Uzbekistan. And some of the panelists here uh, have very much been in uh, the media debating that issue. Um, just for those of you who don't know, the Obama administration has pushed for in the U.S. Congress um, is poised to pass a law that would allow, uh, or rather a waiver that would allow, United States to give Uzbekistan aid to buy equipment for military, known as the Foreign Military Financing. Um, and this had been suspended in 2004 because of Uzbekistan's failure uh, to meet compliance with human rights standards. So um, there's been um, some real debate, uh, both in the newspapers and the blogosphere, about what the U.S. should do with Uzbekistan. And sort of two prominent points made is, well, we know this regime is horrible and ruthless and authoritarian, but hey, our only other alternative is Pakistan. So um, if Afghanistan is going to be the priority, uh, you know, what would you suggest uh, that we do regarding Serb Uzbekistan? So the sort of practical argument, you have to sort of supply the troops. Then the second argument I think is more interesting, and that's sort of a, a kind of a revision of the engagement argument. That is, um, if the U.S. military engages and if we give more contracts to the Uzbek government, they'll once again be in the media spotlight, they'll once again um, uh, uh, be sort of, you know, possibly named and shamed, their behavior will be examined, and uh, that kind of engagement uh, has the potential to shift them and maybe sort of, I'm not sure Graham's advocating this, but I'll borrow from his metaphor, that would be the sort of top-down view, right, that you could nudge the security services. Some people have even invoked Egypt as being the model for Uzbekistan um, at some point do the right thing. So uh, I'd just like to get your comment briefly if you want to take it up on the whole Uzbek FMF thing, and, and especially in the light of what Bob was saying, um, you know, at the end that, you know, it, it, it strikes me in this time of financial crisis that the West doesn't have any more public goods to give, mm -hmm. right? We give private goods, U.S. military gives private goods and so forth, but, you know, the countries that are giving public goods are countries like China, it's countries like the Gulf in terms of the Arab Spring, they're the ones who are actually sort of funding the transition. So um, if just to weigh in on that, sort of FMF Uzbekistan, what does that say about, I think, you know, both our strategies and the credibility of the whole human rights Western engagement enterprise now? Whoever wants to jump in. And he, I'm, I'm happy to jump in. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, our view, human rights watch view, is that <coughs> in a sense we're not, um, we're not naive. We, we recognize the... The, the tough call that the U.S. has to make between Pakistan and Uzbekistan, and we're not, in a sense, you know, um, anti-military, anti-security by any measure. So we see the sort of the tough measure they have to take. On the other hand, we think this is something which is vastly also in Uzbekistan's interest, and therefore the price should be a, should have been a lot higher than it was in terms of these sorts of deals. As waivers should not have been given up so quickly. There should have been more conditions attached to. Um, to, to giving it up. We, obviously, we're opposed to being given up, but, but in terms of our sort of analysis of the situation, it seems that that, that was moving down that path, so we saw that way. Um, 
we, would, we were very keen, we wrote letters, we coordinated NGOs in writing letters to Congress on this. We were very keen on the, the State Department at least um, not pretending that human rights were getting better, not right. linking, the, linking the deal to somehow that things had been getting better. And even on that front, that was, it, the, the, the Obama administration was disappointing. Clinton made some sort of comments which underlined the, French, the, the higher levels of friendship between the two countries and things. So we were quite disappointed, to say the least, on her language on that. Um, looking forward, um, I think there's, there's very little evidence, perhaps no evidence at all, that, 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 that um, giving more traditional or military aid to, to Uzbekistan will, will lead to change. There's not, I mean, we, you, we can debate I mean, we can you know look at look at previous examples and things, but I'm sure that uh, there's very little evidence that that um, that giving them more more money or putting them in the public spotlight will will um, improve the human rights record. Quite the opposite; it's more likely to feel, make the regime feel more secure um, and and increase the you know increase the if U.S. or Western companies are involved in, without conditions being attached and without them being being sort of um, embarrassed in doing so, it'll make it more legitimate for Western companies also to, to associate themselves with the Uzbek regime. Yeah. Thanks. I think I would only add to that. It's, it's one of these um, policy challenges for which there aren't easy uh, solutions in the scheme of, of these challenges. But I think if you take Robert's point looking back, with hindsight, it would have been far wiser to have a more comprehensive and consistent policy which included both the US and the European Union, because all too often you had the EU peeling off Germany with uh, mm. its own entreaties to the regime there that seemed to uh, deviate from um, at least some modicum of uh, backbone on some of these issues. But I think the very fact that we've um, wandered in and out of these waiver discussions over the last decade, it simply signals to the authorities in Tashkent that they need to wait and be patient and in the end, they'll get what they need. And I think that, mm. at, a, at a more strategic level, presents um, uh, enormous challenges at that point. Why should they feel as though they have to behave any differently, even if they were inclined to do so on the margins? Right. I, I would just uh, say that, that, that on, on the one hand, while, it, while it's likely that if, if things are going to open up somewhat in somewhere like Uzbekistan, then, then it's probably going to have a uh, a, a top-down sort of uh, dimension to it. I, I think in, engagement from from the outside, I would just echo what John said that there's very little evidence at all um, that it really has 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 has, has much effect in terms of um, uh, Western uh, government assistance at, at, at least. Um, and there is there's um, no reason at all I think to believe that military assistance is the is the if, if engagement is to have an effect, um, military assistance is probably not the right way to go. Bob, do you want to weigh in on Uzbekistan? Or? Okay, let's open it up. So uh, please, if you could, uh, if you have a question, please step up to the microphone and just state your name and affiliation and who the question is directed to. Oh, oops. Orange Careful. Is an alumnus of the original Russian Institute as oh. it was reconstituted in the old days. I've heard a lot of very interesting reportage, uh, but I can't help wondering what do we learn from all of this? Are there any general conclusions that you could formulate? Some have been adumbrated, but you know the old Soviet Union spawned all these countries. When the Soviet Union was in charge of Eastern Europe, it was also in charge of countries with varied backgrounds, and the result was different even while the Soviet Union controlled them. We know that the Romanian economy was much poorer than the East German economy. In fact, somebody once said, nobody has ever invented a system that could prevent the Germans from working. And I wonder if there's an analogous situation. Are there any features in common that would incline these various countries to accept or reject human rights? There, I, there should be some kind of uh, what preconditions existed in these countries that, from which we could learn something. Good. Okay. Preconditions. Let's take a uh, another another two, and we'll bundle in the responses. Jack Snyder from Columbia. Uh, I wanted to ask you, Graham, uh, to follow up on the top-down model and uh, exactly what the mechanism is. 
um, the top-down, authoritarian-led uh, programs of change that produce democracy that I'm most familiar with are South Korea, Taiwan, and Chile where the authoritarian regime was not intending to produce democracy, but was intending to produce a, a more efficient, uh, well-managed form of authoritarianism based on an export-oriented market economy that in order to function required a certain degree of uh, rule of law, at least in commercial affairs, and had the effect of uh, producing social stability, a middle class that after a while just um, put the need for authoritarianism out of business and uh, the regime fell uh, like uh, a ripe piece of fruit. And, um, so, and that didn't actually require um, necessarily a huge uh, amount of uh, leverage or bargaining over human rights or pressure to open up from the outside world. The main effect, as I understand it, was just the effect of uh, international trade and the introduction of the, the idea of uh, normal, you know, uh, rule-based um, economic exchange. And so I'm, I'm wondering if, um, I mean, you, you talked about top-down instances in Africa. I'm not sure whether the mechanism there was different. But in any case, I'm wondering whether there are prospects for top-down change based on that kind of mechanism in any of the post-communist states. Great. Okay, let's take those two for a start. Um, so I, I think these questions are sort of <clears throat> related in the sense of, of general rules. One, one of and, and, and the, the, the model of top-down um, uh, politics. So one, one thing that I think is a general rule that, that that's important to, to keep in mind is that liberalization, some form of political opening, is not the same as democratization. Um, this is an old uh, lesson, but it's but it's but it's very true, and, it, and it's easy easy to forget. Um, so you can have uh, political liberalization in, in, in lots of places and open up to the opposition without that somehow inevitably can, holding within itself the, 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 the fruits, the, you know, the seeds of, of, of long-term democratization. And what you can end up with, as we've talked about, is, is quite a lot of variation. And so in some ways, the, the, the analogy to, well, they're all communists, but they're actually, in reality, they're all very different, um, is, not, is, not, is not a bad one. Um, that sort of leads to, to, the, to the, this issue of top-down liberalization in the, in the, in the post-Cold War era. Um, these, these are, I, I agree with, with, with Jack, that these are not authoritarian regimes that are planning on, you know, for some kind of uh, altruistic reasons uh, or, or, or ideological reasons embarking upon democratization. But that it is true that in the contemporary world there are significant costs or there can be significant costs um, to um, uh, to authoritarian regimes, to being for, for, for being authoritarian, especially if you don't happen to be lucky enough um, to be an exporter of hydrocarbons mm. uh, or to be a great place for, for basing, uh, uh, you know, supplying troops in, in Afghanistan. Um, so if you're, if you're in East Africa uh, or, or, or in West Africa, you're Tanzania or Ghana, there are real costs uh, to, to, to uh, being isolated from the international community. And those regimes understood uh, quite quickly that what they could do is they could have elections, um, and so long as they got to design the rules for those elections, uh, they could win them. Um, and progressively over time, those elections became increasingly more, 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 more liberal, more open, more competitive, not democratic, um, but, but, but it's definitely significantly more open than they had been before. And that, I think, is a, is a, is, is, is a model that, um, that one might, might think of for, for Eurasia, but very complicated by the, those countries that are, that are big hydrocarbon exporters and that have uh, other forms of, other reasons why the costs of, of authoritarianism are not so high. So maybe Georgia is, is, is somewhere that you might think in, in that case where um, there are very significant costs. So Saakashvili is facing this choice of, do, do I do a Putin and become prime minister? Uh, I've already changed the constitution to, to make that uh, 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 an attractive move. Can I handle the international opprobrium of doing that? 
Um, and so there's going to be significant, uh, there have been significant sort of uh, Sackett's really government initiated measures to, to at least uh, liberalize the political environment in order to, to kind of get away with, with, with that kind of move. Anyone else want to weigh? Well, maybe I'd just say yeah. a word on, on the first question. I think also related to Robert's observations, what we've learned now, I think, is that the assumptions we had in the non-Baltic former Soviet Union should have been somewhat different than the ones we had, say, in the early and mid-90s, in the sense that I think there was too much optimism that certain um, parts of society would open and grow roots, say, beyond the political opening and moving more to the democratization and even governance dimension of, of things there. So in the 90s, Russia was extraordinarily chaotic. It was an extremely difficult time for uh, ordinary Russians. Um, that doesn't mean that objectively the system that has followed it over the course of the last 12 years will be better for ordinary Russians. It's a response to some of the events that these days, as the narrative goes, says that was a time of chaos. That happened to be democracy during the 90s. Therefore, the period now of presumed order and stability is better. I think one of the things that I um, always find disturbing, and it comes back to this notion of how we label and define things, and I think Robert even used this term in his discussion of Kyrgyzstan, saying that people feel as though democracy hasn't worked in Kyrgyzstan. I think the question is whether Kyrgyzstan has actually had democracy. I would argue it hasn't. I think you know, since the um, Tulip Revolution in 2005, it's had some openings. It's had um, the hurly-burly of nascent <clears throat> possible democratic ferment. But I don't think there's much of an argument to say that it's actually growing roots to be an institutionalized democratic, certainly not a liberal democracy in any stretch of the word. I'd be much more inclined to say it's either a hybrid or, at least in our reckoning now as of last year, it really hovers on the line between authoritarian, semi-authoritarian, by virtue of this horrible illiberalism to minorities and the number right. of deaths and the ethnic right. violence, the inability of the police and the state to protect the rights of those people. Uh, the elections were good, and that was promising in many ways. But I think what you have there are huge gaps just blown in the whole of, of the system, which really argues against calling it a democracy. And I think we fall into the trap of saying, Democracy isn't delivering in, in this sort of setting. And I, frankly, you hear it in other settings. You hear um, you know, Kazakhstan's democracy doesn't deliver. You read this in the papers, in the mainstream media. I think it's a very dangerous thing because it, it in some ways validates the narrative that uh, comes, for example, out of Russia that the democracy of the 90s uh, was the problem. And it had nothing to do with the decades that predated 1991, right. for example. That never comes into the narrative and the discussion in Russia today. To be sure, the, the steps and missteps of the 90s should be in the debate, but it shouldn't solely be on that. And I think this, this will return to the discussion in the non-Baltic former Soviet Union in a number of ways. And I, I would advise uh, everyone who has an opportunity to give a soundbite or a quote or do analysis to uh, be cautious in the way they put that democracy that can deliver term into yeah. the mix. Well, I, I, I want to pick up on, on something related to that, and it was a, a theme throughout the presentations, and this sort of tarnishing democracy-promoting actors as being Western, right? And the type of targeting, the sort of selective sanctioning of international actors um, and, and giving them that kind of stigma. What advice are you giving your own organizations, or what advice would Graham give um, to sort of counteract that? Right? Because it seems from your presentations that it's been remarkably successful. The OSCE's election monitoring division, the ODIR, actually has capitulated on a lot of these issues. Um, that these sort of terms that we in the academy say, oh, sovereign democracy and so forth, they are having an effect. I mean, one strategy might be when we heard from Ken Roth at a, a meeting Jack had organized a couple weeks ago that you know the franchising of human rights in localities might be one way out of this, right? To say, no, we sort of translate these 
issues and goals for sort of local norms, um, but are there techniques to counter the counter techniques, if, if you see what I mean? And, and, and what would you, what are you thinking about in your, in your strategy rooms as to sort of how to rebut this, this pushback? I'd love to hear Graham's advice. <laughs> I, wish, I wish I had it. Yes. Um, I mean, so, what, so one of the things that's really striking uh, for, for me in watching uh, events in, in, in Russia over the last sort of couple of decades is, is two things. One, one, one is how authoritarianism has become glamorous hmm. uh, again, and the Putin regime has really made an enormous effort um, to make authoritarianism sexy. Um, they sort of literally made an effort to, to make it seem that way. Um, and and that, that's, that's quite, you know, coming out of the Brezhnev era and all that's kind of, kind of surprising. Um, but the, the, the one sort of uh, hard fact that they keep coming up against or the, 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 the difficulty that they have, I don't, I don't think that the sort of um, degree of, of um, the relative degree of openness in Russia is, is, is somehow about impressing the West. I don't think they particularly care what the West thinks. But I think that there's a very strong sense in uh, sort of uh, you know, the, the, the status intelligentsia, for, for, to, to, to use a, a, a term that you read, um, that somehow at least these trappings of, of democracy have to be there for, for people's dignity. Um, and and, and, and if, if we could um, somehow find a way of um, associating the, the message of human, of human rights and democracy not with, not with Western values but with human dignity, which mm -hmm. I, I know people do uh, try or strive very hard to do. But, but that, I think, is, is one idea that, that's actually uh, still extremely powerful in, in, in the region. So um, that would be my suggestion. Well, I think I'd just add, in, in general terms, you had a confluence of events that have created uh, greater challenges, in part the economic crises that have hit the um, democratic world have, uh, I think, presented greater challenges in the sense that people are questioning the, the strength and the um, governance capacity of the United States, the European Union. And um, there's uh, enough in the news today to have a real discussion about that. Um, at the same time, China's evolution has clearly made an impact in the sense that, at least until now, um, it's someone, uh, China Han was saying to me not long ago that five years ago, it would have almost been unthinkable to talk about the China model as being a um, reasonable, viable alternative in discussions. And now it's absolutely common currency in these discussions in terms of suppressing economic, uh, suppressing political rights, um, uh, having what uh, ostensibly are more efficient governance um, uh, capacity and instruments and so forth. Uh, that also has been in the mix, and that's, I think, very important in, in, the, in the larger public discussion. I think there's also been far too much of a willingness of uh, the leadership in the democracies to make the case for the democratic idea. With all of its flaws, I mean, the flaws are clear. You look at the American political system, the warts are out there for everyone to you know, pick at and, and uh, attack. But it seems like West European leading states, the United States, have been far too uh, willing to simply abandon the debate on why there are advantages to this system and why, in mm -hmm. the end, it's more durable and delivers more public goods to its citizens. Uh, and that's a real problem because that at a very basic level uh, just creates a vacuum in the discussion and it uh, leaves it to NGOs and others to try to find the gaps as, as, as they're able. I would just add a couple of things. I mean, I, I agree with the term human dignity. We heard a few moments ago. That's a sort of a term Human Rights Watch uses and we'd obviously try to focus on, on universal values, not Western values in this debate. We're not a, we also see a, don't see ourselves as a pro-democracy organization. We try to get away from... Um, Using that that line, well, obviously, you know, democracy is very important. But we don't, we don't portray ourselves in that in that sort of sense. The other thing is picking up the point we just heard about, um, you know, there's lots of problems in the West. Human Rights Watch makes a um, makes an effort to put resources into analysing human rights concerns in in North America, in the U.S., in Canada, and in very much in Western Europe as well, where I'm based, and you know, to try not to be to try to dodge the double standards criticism that we're not tackling 
human rights problems in their own backyard, which right. often comes from governments in Central Asia and elsewhere. Yeah, very much so. Uh, um, I, I just want to say on the earlier point about uh, uh, the, na the narrative of democracy being a failure to deliver. I'm not saying that I believe that. I'm just saying that that narrative has really taken hold in Central Asia and is uh, very hard to dig that out now, it's, uh, uh, whether it's true or not. Um, but a uh, Singaporean diplomat called Kishore Mababani recently wrote a paper about this sort of what I think he described as the trust deficit uh, in both authoritarian countries and in democracies in that the leaderships in these countries are simply incapable of speaking with any truth to their constituencies anymore. And that we've reached some sort of odd impasse where, you know, for example, in this country, the debates the political debates in Washington over the budget and whatever else are, are completely constrained by you know, this inability to actually uh, talk in any sort of honest, coherent manner about the problems that this country faces in its economy. Uh, and likewise, you know, the Putin doesn't talk about the $40 billion that he's stolen or um, you know, all the, the catastrophic uh, state of, of public health, for example, in in Russia with its uh, you know, shocking, declining uh, life expectancy and appalling drug problems and all these just you know, rampaging things that go through them. So I think there, there is a, uh, more of a demand than ever before for um, sort of pressure to be applied for a, a more truthful narrative and that comes from all sorts of different places. I do think, though, the one thing that uh, specifically to Central Asia and maybe to the other parts of Eurasia as well that is important is to address people's economic issues in a more thorough way. And that can also be a sort of rights-based approach to that as well. I think there's a lot that can be done in terms of um, building up uh, people's capacity to monitor their governments, to... Mm. Um, push back against terrible economic policies to take hold of those sorts of institutions and issues themselves. And I think you're going to gain a lot more traction. And I think that also has, a, has the possibility of leading to broader political engagement. And, but I do think that we need to, in some ways, rethink our view of transitions in, in various places. And we've seen that in Afghanistan and Iraq and lots of other places. But uh, electricity needs to come first, followed by water, followed by schools, followed by parks. Uh, followed by clean sidewalks, and then probably followed by political parties, and then a constitution, and then elections. I think we have to get away from that focus on elections and go back to much more basic uh, ways to help people. Great. Let's take uh, one, one more round. Um, yep, please. Hi, my name is Tsveta Petrova and I'm at the Harriman Institute as well. My question actually goes to the discussion that we just had about models. And it's clear that there are models that authoritarians are trying perhaps to copy. But I want to ask a question about models from a different angle. So for example, Christopher Walker talked about the ways that Russia is redefining democracy as a sovereign democracy. And then he also talked about the international projection of authoritarian influence. And then Hugh Williamson talked about the Central Asian models of development. So I'm wondering if you are seeing those countries actually consciously projecting a certain model instead of just resisting um, the diffusion of the Western mm. models of democracy and development within their own states. And if you are seeing them consciously exporting a particular model, whether it's a political model of a certain type of democracy, sovereign democracy, I don't know what other kind of democracy, or a model of development, what kind of features do they see as being part of that model? Yeah, good question. And uh, yes, please. Hi, my name is Yako Davalorek. I work for the... Um, <clears throat> Sorry, the United Nations Development Program. Um, the question is simple, and I know that some of your organizations have elaborate views on the universal periodic review process. I'm just wondering whether you think among the methods to challenge authoritarian regimes, whether this exposing of some failures or challenges on international yet intergovernmental forum, whether that's, that is a method to, to challenge and then alleviate the situation eventually. Thanks. Great, thank you. On oh, the UPR was that, yeah? And, yeah. yeah. and yes, yeah, so, I'll give you the last question. I'm Alvaro Minsk, Columbia University. 
I want to ask you, what do you think about um, democracy in Ukraine right now? Okay, great. <laughs> oh, three great topics. So <laughs> models that can be exported from any of these countries. Um, then two, uh, the, the periodic review, is that a dated type of strategy, naming and shaming and compliance and so forth? And then uh, Ukraine, if anyone has thoughts on that. I would say that I don't... The, the Chinese model is very exportable because hundreds of millions of Chinese have gone from poverty into a degree of prosperity, and the country has developed in the most staggering way. But that's not visible anywhere in, in Central Asia or Russia or anywhere else. I mean, none of these countries have really delivered uh, the same level of uh, movement away from poverty or the same level of development that China has. So I think China offers a certain appeal out there for this sort of authoritarian model, but none of the countries in Eurasia, I think, have anything to offer the rest of the world, and I don't think they've really tried that much either. I, don't, I doubt that they would, I don't know if Putin is thinking along these lines, but uh, there's very little effort to sort of project that uh, out of the area. Yeah. Nazarbayev has this whole image of promoting tolerance, right, and religious well, yeah. freedom and so forth kind of thing he's been trying, but yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, I mean, in, indeed, I mean, I, I would, I mean, I would, I would, yeah. I don't know whether I, I, I'm sort of torn on it. I mean, to some extent, I would say that Kazakhstan has has tried that, but particularly on that sort of front, this sort of international religious tolerance. Even though the government is debating a new law on on re religious, you know, um, repression rather than religious freedom in the country, it's. Um, I recall a fascinating. A meeting I had, it was a lunch in fact, in my previous life as a financial times with, with top aides to, to, um, to Nazarbayev from, from Kazakhstan. And it was a, and it was a, it was a battle, it was a sort of, you know, with financial times journalists trying to sort of penetrate the, the, their, their version of a model. And this was in the headquarters of the FT in London, sort of them coming and talking to British diplomats and journalists and think tanks and so on about what was all the great things about Kazakhstan. So that was a sort of a, you know, a model exporting in its own, in, you know, in practice, as it were. And, and you know, despite our sort of efforts to, to, to pose penetrative questions about political freedoms or about um, the, the elections early this year or about religious freedoms or about economic issues, we, you know, the, it, it was an impenetrable sort of wall of, of, of rhetoric and in, internal logic, if you see what I mean. So certainly on that mission, my own personal impression was that there was a, um, perhaps not a full effort to export it, but at least when they were on the road, it was a bit like a road show, put it that way, I would say. Um, I mean, Ukraine, just a couple of comments about obviously the Timoshenko trial is something we've been um, trying to follow as much as we can, and obviously the, the sort of the, the, the um, the, the coming, coming to the head of a sort of, of a new EU-Ukraine trade and cooperation agreement is an important thing to watch in terms of Ukraine's political and economic development and, 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 you know, its human rights agenda. I mean, we're sort of, you know, we're, we, we're concerned that the EU may, we're, we're, we're pleased that the EU, you know, the Commission and some member states are trying to put more pressure on Ukraine at this late stage in terms of um, making them change their laws to do with such political trials, but we're, we're watching closely the way you know the EU does sort of negotiate the finer details of this cooperation and trade agreement with uh, Kiev. Um, I think that's what I'd add for the moment. Uh, the the question on the models is a, is a very interesting one in the sense that um, as these countries and governments that have been integrated, increasingly integrated into these different institutions and um, bodies at the regional level, supranational level, um, have become more active, it's not really clear that there's any sort of ideology or coherent um, uh, rationale behind what they're doing, perhaps other than uh, defending and safeguarding what are often some rather narrow private interests from systems that are being led in many ways by either crony capitalist um, models, patronage-based models, and beyond that, to say that there's something that they would have to offer to others, it's really hard to find that. Now, in China's case, I think, as Robert noted, there are other countries that look to China and say, hey, there's a, there's a government that 
is uh, seemingly managed to maintain stability by um, enabling uh, economic growth and at the same time uh, not enabling any sort of meaningful institutional accountability or political rights, uh, that is a path that we could take as well. I think that has certainly gotten into the discussion, but I don't think there's a discernible uh, model other than um, in many ways looking to limit the um, aspects of these international bodies that would pose the greatest challenge to the regime, regimes domestically. And I think that's why we've seen this incredible focus in the last four to five years on the OSCE, uh, which has a mandate that includes the countries we're discussing, and in particular, the um, body within the OSCE that focuses on rule of law, democracy, and elections. So you see now um, uh, real efforts to create the elections analog to uh, what you see with NGOs in a number of countries. So you see more gongos coming into being in some of these countries. You'll also see, um, I won't recall the precise name, but they're usually a, it's an election monitoring group that is organized by uh, the Commonwealth of Independent States or something along these lines. And they go in and say, hey, you know, the elections in Uzbekistan were great again. And they put that out into the public information space. Um, I don't think it's so much for the outside world as it is to have at least somebody that's contesting right. another body that's there, but it's very important for the information channels within these countries. So they can say, we had our own uh, sovereign, uh, as it were, um, observers, and they found that these elections were peaceful, or, and that would be the term you'd be more up to hear than, say, free and open, this sort of thing. Um, on Ukraine, really briefly, I think the greatest source of concern at an institutional level is that the encroachments we've observed in our analysis and the reports we've been doing under the um, Yanukovych government have focused precisely on the areas that had the most opening and the most promise during the five years uh, after the um, Orange Revolution. So there are a lot of imperfections there. Uh, judicial reform didn't move at all, just to give an example, over during the, uh, the Yushchenko period. But what they've really focused on in the last year is civil society, uh, the news media, and political opposition. And one of the things that um, many outsiders had believed had been institutionalized in Ukraine, uh, really uh, unusually to the non-Baltic former Soviet Union, were competitive, generally accepted elections and the ability of the news media to cover them both during the election cycles, between election cycles, and the ability of civil society to play a meaningful role in this respect. I think to the extent the focus on those sectors and institutions continues, it's exceedingly worrisome for the prospects for Ukraine to continue on any sort of um, trajectory that would include uh, democracy, human rights, and uh, dignity, if we want to use those terms. So I, I guess I, I, would, I would dissent just a, a, a tiny bit on the, uh, there's been, been way too much unanimity on this, on this panel in general. Um, so I, I, on, the, on this issue of models, um, I actually think that one of the, the, the hallmarks of, of high Putinism, if you, if, you, if, you, if you let me call it that, um, has been the, a really much deeper understanding of, of, of the nature of soft power and of the effort to actually sell uh, what's going on in Russia as a model and as something that's defensible and, and respectable and, and sort of and, and even imitable in the in the world. Um, if you look uh, on, on my cable TV in North Carolina, I, I get to sit and watch Russia Today uh, of, of, of an evening, um, and <laughs> the the resources that they put into that 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 channel. One of my one of my uh, former master's students actually now has his own show on Russia Today in the afternoon, which is which is a fantastic <laughs> business show, well, well worth watching. Um, but they've put really significant resources into, um, to, into creating a narrative in English uh, about the way the world works and, and, and how the world should be. Um, that's, that, that, that's their spin. Um, I think that they've, uh, all of their efforts that, 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 that Chris and others talked about in, in the blogosphere, um, I think Nashi and their, and their efforts to sort of uh, uh, promote positive images of, of Russia domestically and export them internationally have been, have been very vigorous and, and, and reasonably 
successful. I'm not sure that there is a, a coherent underlying you know, model that, that, that one would normatively recommend, but I think they've made a big effort to try and, and sell it. Another thing that comes to mind is the efforts to set up substitutes for, 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 for traditional democratic representative styles of consultation, so things like public chambers and, and other sort of rigged uh, or regime-dominated uh, forms of consultation, uh, I think, are, are also part of what they think of as being uh, a real model. Um, and I think there's, a, there's constituencies for that. My, the place that I can talk a little bit about in this regard is Kyrgyzstan, um, where the, uh, when you're talking to, to, to uh, government uh, actors and, 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 and parliamentarians there, um, they, they spend a tremendous amount of time in Moscow and they spend a tremendous amount of time studying United Russia uh, and, and trying, to, trying to follow um, uh, what they see as, 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 as the Russian model. Um, and then when you do surveys in, in Kyrgyzstan and you ask people you know, what, what, where their country should be looking, um, the, an overwhelming number of per percentage of the population will tell you Russia is the, is the place they should be looking at. So I, I think there actually really has been an effort to develop some kind of to turn sovereign democracy into, into, into a model for, for other places. Great. Yeah, thank you. I, um, I thought I'd just pick up on the periodic review questions yes, that nobody else has. Um, uh, I'm no expert on it, um, but just a couple of quick things. I mean, um, uh, I mean, obviously, Human Rights Watch is, is you know, in favor of such, such uh, reviews continuing. Obviously, they have problems, and there are challenges in, in, um, in making them effective and, and, and have resonance and in significance and importance where, they're, where they take place. But it goes back to a little bit we discussed earlier about the sort of universal values. It's important that these such reviews take place everywhere. I mean, my, there's one coming up in my home country of the UK in the next couple of months, and you know, we try to encourage the UK government to pay attention to this. You know, there's a lot of human rights complacency in Western Europe, um, for instance. And, and you know, if you're trying to make the UK pay attention, then you've, that's part of the aim and part of the task of getting Central Asian governments also to, to listen to and to pay attention to the results of, of periodic reviews as well. So um, with all their faults and with all the, the cumbersome and sometimes ineffective UN procedures, they're you know, it's worth keeping. Right. Well, I think we're out of time for today, but thank you uh, to the panel for uh, a really rich, engaging discussion. Thank you uh, to Harriman, uh, to Lydia, Hamilton for making this happen, and we hope that we'll see you soon uh, at another Harriman event. So uh, please join me in uh, congratulating the speakers.